ML Culp says, thanks for being a local supporter, by the way. A good friend of mine is near the end of a long journey from atheism to Christianity, but mm-hmm. he's leaning towards Eastern Orthodox. Uh-huh. Praise God. What are some good arguments that I can use that a complete new person like him would understand? So I suppose what he's asking for is arguments for Catholicism over Eastern Orthodoxy, but I'm not sure. Yeah, so I would I would say a couple things. Because um, I had to face this question when I was becoming Catholic. You know, like I said, I read the theologies of all different branches of Christianity before I was Catholic, including Eastern Orthodoxy. So I had to face the question, should I be Catholic or should I be Eastern Orthodox? And... I ended up writing a short piece about this that was eventually published called Why I Am Not Eastern Orthodox. So if you Google Jimmy Aiken, Why I Am Not Eastern Orthodox, you'll get the gist of of those arguments. Fundamentally, it comes down to the issue of the Pope. Now, both the Eastern Orthodox and Catholics agree that the Pope is the successor of Peter in a unique way. And that the Pope, therefore, has a leadership role that is unique in the church. What they differ about is how does that leadership role function? Is it meant to be a sort of first among equals, like those in the Orthodox communion would say? Or is it meant to have more substantive authority, like those in the Catholic Church would say? So I think that's the real issue that needs to be settled here. Everything else, if you settle that, everything else falls into place. Um so there are a few things that I have pointed out and that I pointed out to myself when I was making this decision. First one is to ask a question, would the disciples have even understood the concept of a first among equals that has ceremonial authority but no authority beyond that? You know, we have such positions today like in the US Supreme Court, the chief justice uh, has very limited authority. He gets the same vote as everybody else. He, other than that, he's able to do a few things for bookkeeping purposes. Like if if he's in the majority, he gets to assign who writes the decision. If he's not in the majority, then someone else decides who writes the decision. But he's fundamentally equal to all the rest, and he just has some procedural mm. authority. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Is that how authority worked in the culture that Jesus and the apostles were living in? Can we think of anybody in that culture who was regarded as having authority that had a purely procedural or ceremonial authority? No. Can this I, is not a this is not a concept real in quick, ancient Israel. How do the Eastern Orthodox understand first among equals today what, what does that mean or is well, there a disagreement on this I, I would I haven't I haven't done a survey okay um, but the idea would be every bishop is fundamentally equal to the Pope and the Pope may have a certain prerogative of honor okay, okay. or maybe he gets to preside if we're having an ecumenical council or okay. something like that but he's fundamentally equal to everybody else no special authority beyond what other bishops or at least other patriarchs have. Um, but that's not how ancient Israelites thought about authority. They, they, if God gives you authority, you've got substantive authority and you can use it. Um, kings were not firsts among equals. High priests were not firsts among equals. Mm -hmm. Uh, The high priest got to do things that no other priest could do. And kings got to make decisions for everybody. Um, so if Jesus gives you authority and you're coming in that cultural context that doesn't have procedural positions, then you're going to understand the authority that Peter has been given in substantive rather than procedural terms. So that was yep. one, one thing that occurred to me. Another thing that occurred to me is here we have a situation that's analogous to the split between the the northern tribes and the southern tribes. Mm-hmm. So Israel is originally a confederacy of, of 12 tribes, mm-hmm. plus the 13th that we don't really count, the, the Levites, because they're spread all over the place. They don't have their own territory. Um, so you got the 12 tribes of Israel. And because everything's turned around in Middle Eastern politics, instead of the south seceding from the north, the north secedes from the south. And that happens after the time of Solomon, after his son Rehoboam comes onto the throne. 
And God says, this is okay, this is from me, but the northern kingdom still needs to worship in Jerusalem where I put my temple. So, and that's the position that the Bible endorses. Now, the Samaritans disagreed with that. They want to say the temple is not in Jerusalem. It's on Mount Gerizim in Samaria. In fact, if you go to Israel today, there is a surviving Samaritan community. There's a few hundred of them. And... um, and every Passover, they will go up to the ruins of the Samaritan temple on Mount Gerizim and sacrifice the Passover lamb. And you can see photos of this and watch videos of this. It's very interesting. But it is not the perspective of the, of the canonical Bible. Um, the perspective of the Bible that we Christians and Jews accept is that God eventually chose Jerusalem to be the site of his temple, and all of Israel needed to go to Jerusalem to worship. So what we have is two communities that were originally one that have now separated, and one of them has a particular institution, namely the temple, whereas the other that is in separation, does not have the temple. And they have different understandings of the proper role of this institution. The institution, the the community that has it, the the southern community, Mm -hmm. the, the the kingdom of Judah, turns out to have the correct understanding. God did say, put his temple in Jerusalem. And they've got the correct understanding of the temple institution, whereas the uh, the northern tribes that have seceded from Union don't have the institution of the temple, and they have gone become mistaken on its proper understanding. They think the temple needs to be on Mount Gerizim instead of on Mount Mount Zion. Um, so that's a biblical situation. But notice the parallels mm. to what we have here, where we have. Two communities, Catholic and Orthodox, that were originally united. Yeah. Now they're in a state of separation. One of them has this institution, the papacy, mm. and the other is, is acknowledges it, but has a different understanding. So which group is God more likely to guide into a correct understanding of the institution? Is he more likely to guide into a correct understanding the group that has the institution or the group that is in separation from the institution? Mm -hmm. Well, I think on a priori grounds or just on the face of it grounds, he's more likely to guide the people that have the institution, that are in in union with the institution, are more likely to be guided into a correct understanding of the institution. And that seems supported by the biblical parallel with the temple, where the community that had the temple had the correct understanding of the temple, and the community that was in separation did not have Mm -hmm. a correct understanding. So I think God is more likely to guide the Catholic community that's in union with the papacy into a correct understanding of the papacy Mm -hmm. compared to the group that is not in communion with the papacy. So that would be another point why I would argue in favor of a Catholic understanding of the faith rather than an Eastern Orthodox understanding. That is a Good explanation. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Hey, thank you so much for watching. Before you go, do us a favor, leave a comment, let us know what you thought of the video, like, and subscribe.